Part thirty of the Chronicles of Crime, Volume one, by Camden Pelham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part thirty, John Wilkes, Esquire, convicted of sedition and blasphemy. The year seventeen sixty eight will ever be memorable in the annals of English history on account of the murders and mischief committed by a deluded mob, stimulated by the writings and opposition to the government of John Wilkes, Esquire, an alderman of London and Member of Parliament for Aylesbury. The most scandalous and offensive of his writings were in a periodical publication called The North Britain, number 45, and a pamphlet entitled An Essay on Woman. Footnote. The Essay on Woman was a parody on Pope's sublime work called An Essay on Man. A learned divine, the Reverend Mr. Kidgel, thus writes on the works of Wilkes. On the title page is an obscene print with a Greek inscription signifying the Saviour of the world. We shall, the poison of the publication being long eradicated, merely quote a commentator on the subject. In this work, an essay on woman, the lewdest thoughts are expressed in terms of the greatest obscenity, the most horrid impurity is minutely represented, the sex is vilified and insulted, and the whole is scurrilous, impudent, and impious, to an incredible degree. In the variations and notes the inspired writings are perverted into the gross ideas of a libidinous blasphemer, with an invention new, wonderful, and horrid. The most solemn and important passages of the Gospel are tortured into the oblique obscenity of double meanings, worthy only of him who is at once the enemy of God and man. End of footnote. The North Britain was of a political nature, the other a piece of obscenity, the one calculated to set the people against the government, the other to corrupt their morals. Amongst the ministers who found themselves more personally attacked in the North Britain was Samuel Martin, Esquire, member for Camelford. This gentleman found his character as Secretary to the Treasury so vilified that he called the writer to the field. He had before been engaged in a duel with Lord Talbot, and had then escaped unhurt, but Mr. Martin shot him, and the wound proved so dangerous that he lay uncertain of recovering during several days, and was confined to his house for some weeks. His sufferings, however, did not end here, for the Attorney-General filed informations against him as author of the North Britain, number 45, and the pamphlet entitled An Essay on Woman. Footnote. The paper entitled The North Britain was ordered to be burnt by the common executioner at the Royal Exchange. Mr. Alderman Harley, one of the sheriffs of London, attending in his official capacity to see this carried into execution, was assaulted and wounded by the mob. A man of the name of John Franklin was seized as one of the offenders, and committed to Newgate. On the day of the conviction of Wilkes he was tried for this outrage at the Old Bailey, and found guilty. When the trial was ended, the worthy alderman addressed the court in behalf of the prisoner. He said that, for his part, he had forgiven the affront offered to his own person, that justice required a prosecution. It had been, by the conviction of the offender, in part satisfied, and therefore he hoped the court would mitigate his punishment. The court complied with the prosecutor's humane request, and sentenced the prisoner to a short imprisonment, to pay a fine of six shillings and eight pence, and to find security for his good behaviour for one year. End of footnote. On these charges he was apprehended, and his papers having been seized and inspected, he was committed prisoner to the Tower, but was soon admitted to bail. Before his trial came on, Mr. Wilkes fled to France, under the pretext of restoring his health, which had suffered from his wound, and the harassing measures taken against him by the Secretaries of State, Lord Egremont and Lord Halifax, and no sooner was he out of the kingdom than the ministers proceeded to outlawry, dismissed him from his command as Colonel of the Buckinghamshire Militia, and expelled him from his seat in Parliament. While in Paris, he was challenged to fight by Captain Forbes, on account of the reflections which he had cast upon the birthplace of the gallant Captain, Scotland, but he declined the invitation, alleging that he had still an affair to settle with Lord Egremont, before he could venture to take any other duel upon his hands. The death of that noble lord, however, left him free to fight, but on his writing to accept the challenge, his antagonist was not to be found. Mr. Wilkes subsequently returned to London, and gave notice that he should appear to answer the charges preferred against him on a certain day, and then, having appeared in his place as an alderman in Guildhall, on his return the mob took the horses from his carriage and dragged it to his house, crying, "'Wilkes and Liberty!' 
on the 21st of February 1764, the trial of Mr. Wilkes, upon the accusations alleged against him, came on before Lord Mansfield, and he was found guilty on both charges, subject to arguments upon certain points as to the validity of his apprehension, the seizure of his papers, and the judgment of outlawry which had been obtained against him. The discussions preliminary to these arguments occupied the courts at various times during a space of two years, and in the meantime the popularity of Mr. Wilkes and the outrages of the mob increased daily. At length, on the 27th of April, 1768, Mr. Wilkes, having been served with a writ of Capias Utlagatum, was brought to the floor of the Court of King's Bench in the custody of the proper officer, in order that the question of his being admitted to bail might be considered. A long argument took place, but it terminated in favour of the Crown, and Mr. Wilkes was conveyed to the King's Bench prison. On his way thither, the mob seized the coach in which he was carried, and taking the horses from it, dragged him to a public house in Spitalfields, where they permitted him to alight, but at about eleven o'clock at night he effected his escape from his overzealous friends, and, proceeding to the prison, immediately surrendered himself unto the lawful custody. On the following day he was visited by many of his friends, and a vast mob having collected outside the prison, it was feared that some outrage would be committed. All remained quiet, however, until night, when the rails by which the prison wall was surrounded were pulled up and burned as a bonfire, and the inhabitants of Southwark were compelled to illuminate their houses. But upon the arrival of a captain's guard of soldiers, the crowd dispersed without doing any further mischief. On the 28th of April the case of outlawry was determined, and Mr. Sergeant Glynn having appeared on the part of Mr. Wilkes, and the Attorney-General for the Crown, a learned and lengthy argument was heard, the result of which was a unanimous expression on the part of the court that the outlawry must be reversed. The general warrant on which the accused had been apprehended was next considered and declared illegal, but the counsel for the Crown then immediately moved that judgment might be passed upon Mr. Wilkes upon the several convictions which had taken place. This was answered by a motion on his part in arrest of judgment, and the following Thursday was fixed upon for the hearing the point argued. In the meantime a mob had remained assembled around the prison, whom no efforts of the civil force could disperse, but at length the justices appeared, followed by a troop of soldiers, determined at once to put an end to the alarming nuisance which had so long existed. All attempts to procure the separation of the crowd by fair means having failed, the riot act was read, and this also having no effect, the soldiers were ordered to fire. The command was instantly obeyed, and many persons were killed and dangerously wounded, some of whom were passing at a distance from the scene of confusion. At length the day arrived on which the last effort was to be made to get rid of the charges against Mr. Wilkes. But the arguments for an arrest of judgment, though carried on with great ingenuity, would not hold, and he was found to have been legally convicted of writing the libels. For that, in the North Britain, he was fined five hundred pounds, and sentenced to two years' imprisonment in the King's Bench prison, and for the essay on a woman, five hundred pounds more, a further imprisonment of twelve months, and to find security for his good behaviour for seven years. Previously to his imprisonment, Mr. Wilkes had been elected Member of Parliament for Middlesex, when the address which he published to his constituents contained the following passages. In the whole progress of ministerial vengeance against me for several years, I have shown, to the conviction of all mankind, that my enemies have trampled on the laws, and have been actuated by the spirit of tyranny and arbitrary power. The general warrant under which I was first apprehended has been judged illegal. The seizure of my papers was condemned judicially. The outlawry, so long the topic of violent abuse, is at last declared to have been contrary to law, and on the ground first taken by my friend Mr. Sergeant Glynn is formally reversed. The mob, after the election, proceeded to the commission of the most violent outrages. They broke the windows of Lord Bute, the Prime Minister, and of the Mansion House, including even those of the Lady Mayoress's bedchamber, and forced the inhabitants of the metropolis to illuminate their houses, crying out Wilkes and Liberty, and all who refused to echo it back were knocked down. A stone was thrown by this daring mob at the Polish Count Rowotsky, which he dexterously caught in his hand, the windows of his carriage in which he sat being fortunately down, and his lordship looking out and smiling, he received no other violence. The outrages of the populace were too many to be enumerated. Several innocent people were killed, and vast numbers wounded. They broke windows without number, destroyed furniture, and even insulted royalty itself. 
these disgraceful tumults were not confined to the metropolis, and the lenity, or, as some did not hesitate to assert, the timidity, of the government, spread disaffection into all classes of mechanics, who, thinking the time at hand when they might exact what wages they pleased, perhaps even beyond their master's profits, struck work. The sailors, following the example of the landsmen, went in a body of many thousands, with drums beating and colours flying, to St. James's Palace, and presented a petition to the king praying a relief of grievances. Two days afterwards they assembled in much greater numbers and proceeded as far as Palace Yard, in order to petition Parliament for an increase of wages, when they were addressed by two gentlemen standing on the top of a hackney coach, who told them that their petition could not be immediately attended to, but that it would be considered and answered in due time. Whereupon the Tars gave three cheers, and for a while dispersed. A short time afterwards, however, they reassembled at Limehouse, and boarding several outward-bound vessels, seized their crews, pretending that they would not suffer any ships to sail until their wages were increased. The watermen, the Spitalfields weavers, the sawyers, the hatters, and the labouring classes in the country, all combined in the attempt to procure their wages to be raised. But while in London the confusion was nearly universal, in the country its effects were confined to a few districts, where some interested persons managed to excite the peaceably disposed people to acts of outrage. They soon discovered the error into which they had fallen, however, and a few of them having suffered execution, and others some severe imprisonments, they returned to their duty. The folly of popular commotion was never better exemplified than in the case of Wilkes, whose patriotism was accidental and mercenary, for his letters to his daughter clearly show the contempt with which he regarded the enthusiasm in his favour, and the object he had in view in exciting hatred against the government. Many of the deluded people who shouted Wilkes and Liberty were severely injured in the riots, and others were subsequently punished by the outraged laws of the country. In a short time the commotion subsided, and the author of them sunk into comparative obscurity, in which he continued until his death in 1797, at the age of seventy years. Mungo Campbell, convicted of the murder of the Earl of Eglinton. This melancholy case arose out of the existing system of game laws. The lamented Mr. Campbell was descended from a noble family of Argyle, and was born at Eyre in Scotland. His father was an eminent merchant, he had been mayor of the town, and a justice of the peace, but having no less than twenty-four children, and meeting with many losses in his commercial transactions, it was impossible for him to make any adequate provision for his family, so that on his death the relations took care of the children, and educated them in the liberal manner which is customary in Scotland. The unhappy subject of this narrative was protected by an uncle, who gave him a learned education, but this generous friend, dying when the youth was about eighteen years of age, left him sixty pounds a year, and earnestly recommended him to the care of his other relations. The young man was a finished scholar, but seemed averse to make choice of any of the learned professions. His attachment appeared to be the military life, in which many of his ancestors had distinguished themselves. He soon followed the bent of his inclinations, and entered as a cadet in the Royal Regiment of Scots Greys, then commanded by his relation General Campbell, and served during two campaigns at his own expense. Being disappointed in obtaining promotion, however, he returned to Scotland in the year 1745, and Lord Loudon, to whom he was distantly related, having the command of the loyal Highlanders, who exhibited so much bravery in their opposition to the rebellion, Mr. Campbell joined that regiment, and his exertions were equally creditable to his loyalty and his courage. After the Battle of Culloden, he was appointed, through the instrumentality of Lord Loudon, to fill the situation of an officer of excise in Ayrshire and notwithstanding the unpleasant nature of his employment, he succeeded by his courtesy in obtaining the good will of all his neighbours, all of whom, with the exception of the Earl of Eglinton, gave him permission to kill game on their estates. It was his misfortune to live immediately adjoining the property of his lordship, and it would appear that the noble Earl, having once detected him in killing a hare, warned him not to commit a similar offence again. Mr. Campbell apologised for the trespass of which he had been guilty, and excused himself by stating that he was in search of smugglers, and that, having suddenly started the hare, he was surprised, and without thinking he shot it. The ill-will which was raised in his lordship's mind by this circumstance was in no wise removed by some proceedings which Mr. Campbell was compelled to take against Bartley Moore, one of his servants, for smuggling. 
and it appears that his lordship's death was eventually attributable to the steps which he took at the instigation of this very person. About ten in the morning of the 24th of October, 1769, Campbell took his gun and went out with another officer with a view to detect smugglers. Mr. Campbell took with him a license for shooting, which had been given him by Dr. Hunter, though they had no particular design of killing any game, but intended to shoot a woodcock if they should see one. They crossed a small part of Lord Eglinton's estate in order to reach the seashore, where they intended to walk, but when they arrived at this spot it was near noon, and Lord Eglinton came up in his coach, attended by Mr. Wilson, a carpenter, who was working for him, and followed by four servants on horseback. On approaching the coast, his lordship met Bartley Moore, who told him that there were some poachers at a distance. Mr. Wilson would have endeavoured to draw off his lordship's notice from such business, but Bartley Moore saying that Campbell was among the poachers, Lord Ecklington quitted his coach and mounted a led horse, rode to the spot where he saw Campbell and the other officer, whose name was Brown. His lordship said, "'Mr. Campbell, I did not expect to have found you so soon again on my grounds, after your promise when you shot the hare. I must desire that you will give me your gun.' Mr. Campbell refused to deliver up his property, because he said that he was not employing it in an unlawful manner, on which Lord Eglinton rode towards him, apparently with the intention of taking it from him. Mr. Campbell on this raised his gun, and retreating, presented it at his lordship's body. But the latter still followed him, and smiling, asked him if he meant to shoot him. He said that he would if he did not keep off, and then Lord Eglinton desired that his gun should be brought up to him from the carriage. In the interim his lordship dismounted, and going close to Mr. Campbell, again required that he should deliver up the weapon which he carried, but the latter declared that he had a right to carry it, and that he would deliver it to no man, and repeated that his lordship must therefore keep off, unless he wished to be shot. Bartley Moore now interfered, and Mr. Campbell, stumbling against a stone, fell, and Lord Eglinton then advanced as if to seize him. In a moment, however, Mr. Campbell raised himself on his elbow and lodged the contents of his piece in the noble earl's left breast. His lordship directly cried out that he was killed, and Mr. Campbell was seized, but his lordship desired that no violence should be used towards him. Lord Eglinton's seat was about three miles from the place where this fatal event happened, and his servants put him into the carriage to convey him home. In the meantime, Campbell's hands were tied behind him, and he was conducted to the town of Saltcoats, the place of his former station as an exciseman. His lordship, after languishing for ten hours, died, and Mr. Campbell was then committed to the jail of air to await his trial. Upon his being arraigned, upon the indictment preferred against him, various arguments were urged in his favour. It was said that the gun went off by accident, and therefore it could be no more than casual homicide. Secondly, that, supposing it had been fired with an intention to kill, yet the act was altogether justifiable, because of the violent provocation he had received, and he was doing no more than defending his life and property. Thirdly, it could not be murder, because it could not be supposed that Mr. Campbell had any malice against his lordship, and the action itself was too sudden to admit of deliberation. The counsel for the prosecution urged in answer, in the first place, that it was certain malice was implied, in consequence of Campbell's presenting the gun to his lordship, and telling him that, unless he kept off, he would shoot him. Secondly, that there was no provocation given by the Earl besides the words, and words could not be construed a provocation in law. Thirdly, the Earl had a right to seize his gun, in virtue of several Acts of Parliament, which were the established laws of the land to which every subject is obliged to be obedient. After repeated debates between the lawyers of Scotland, a day was at length appointed for the trial, which commenced on the 27th of February 1770, before the High Court of Justiciary, and the jury having found Mr. Campbell guilty, he was sentenced to die. The Lord Justice Clerk, before he pronounced the solemn sentence, addressed himself to the convict, advising him to make the most devout preparation for death, as all hopes of pardon would be precluded from the nature of his offence. The prisoner conducted himself throughout the whole proceedings with utmost calmness, and took leave of his friends in the evening with great apparent cheerfulness, and retiring to his apartment he begged the favour of a visit from them on the following day. In the morning of the 28th of February, 1770, however, he was found dead, hanging to the end of a form which he had set upright, and a silk handkerchief fastened around his neck. The following lines were found upon the floor close to the body. Farewell, vain world, I've had enough of thee, and now am careless what thou sayest of me. 
Thy smiles I court not, nor thy frowns I fear. My cares are past, my heart lies easy here. What faults they find in me take care to shun, and look at home. Enough is to be done. End of part 30